Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to welcome you to our service here today. It's lovely to have you with us as we meet together to worship God. And in our service today, we're going to continue uh, looking at the book of Ruth. Over the last few weeks, we've worked our way steadily through the book of Ruth. Well, today we're going to bring, begin the final chapter. We're going to be looking at the first half of Ruth chapter four. But we're going to do that in just a minute. And be but before we do that, we're going to just spend just a moment as we come together uh, before God, we remember who we are, that as human beings we are sinners, that um, St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, uh, we fall short of the glory of God in what we say, what we do, and how we think and how we live. So we're going to come first of all just to seek God's forgiveness of our sins. And we're going to do that using the words of the confession. So if I say the first sentence, if you respond in the words in bold type, please. So let us return to the Lord our God and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. And of course, the good news is because Jesus died for us, he died for our sins. That means that God can forgive us. He can wipe the slate clean. So may the father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And. As I said just a moment ago, we're going to be looking at the book of Ruth this morning. Um, we've worked our way through the first three chapters and we're about to start this morning Ruth chapter 4, the closing chapter. So I'm going to read to you uh, Ruth chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 1. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd like to open that up with me, then, uh, then I'll read from verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought... I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will not, if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so that I know. For no one has the right to do it except you. And I am the next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with the property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalising transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have brought from Naomi the property of Elimelech, Kilion and Melon, and I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, Melon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among the family from these town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. 
may you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Last week's ripping instalment in the Salva of Ruth ended with her mother-in-law advising her to wait because Boaz would come up with a response soon. And John said, as he always does, that you'd have to come back this week if you wanted to know what happened next. And he knew when he said it that he was intending to go away and leave me to cover the beginning of the last chapter. Note, this is not the whole of the last chapter. He's keeping the final, happy ending of it for himself to do next week. But today we do get to the wedding. But this will not be remotely like any wedding any of us have ever been to, or any wedding that's ever been held in this church, that's ever been held in this country. You'll find that there will be no bride for a start. So the wedding dress, nothing to make everybody go, ah, doesn't she look lovely? Obviously, if there was no bride, there was no need for bridesmaids. And worst of all, no reception afterwards. From a brief glance at the description, it seems to be all about men taking their shoes off. And in my experience, some men's shoes are definitely better left on. But in this bit of the story, which John has left me to preach on, all that seems to be happening is that men are taking their shoes off and talking. And here again, we have the term guardian redeemer popping up. It came in the last chapter we looked at as well. There we were told that Boaz was a guardian redeemer of Ruth and Naomi, and there was a footnote. Now some people don't bother with footnotes, but they can be helpful occasionally. That one told us that the Hebrew word for guardian redeemer is a legal term for one who has the obligation to redeem a relative in serious difficulty. Now though, it's Boaz who is consulting another guardian redeemer. I don't think it's very clear, but after all, this story is about 3,000 years old. And at that time, people in this country were probably running around dressed in animal skins. We certainly didn't have a structure set up for discussing legal situations for social care as they did. So, Boaz has gone to the space just inside the gate of Bethlehem. I hope you haven't forgotten that this story is set in Bethlehem. We were told that in chapter one. Boaz has got the guardian redeemer with him. Now he needs to collect 10 elders together as well. So it really talks that out. Then when they're all sitting down, he comes out with something we don't expect. Something we've never even thought of. The land which had been owned by Naomi's husband Elimelech. The land he'd left at the beginning of this story because of the famine. Taking Naomi and his sons with him. That land is still there. And Naomi now owns it. So Boaz suggests that the guardian redeemer should buy it. But if he doesn't want it, then Boaz himself will buy it. The guardian redeemer says he'll have it, only for Boaz to drop his own shot. If the guardian redeemer buys the land, he will have to take on Ruth as well. And taking on another woman would bring further complications. It could affect his own descendants. If Ruth had children, where would that leave his, the guardian redeemer's children? It could be that any children Ruth had would be treated as the children of her first husband. And this is where complications with the translation crops up. Experts are agreed that there is something not right with verse 5. It doesn't make sense in the original Hebrew. The Bible was usually spread around in the church 
give a different mean, give different meanings that it might have. One idea is that Boaz was the choir of Ruth, so the guardian redeemer said that Boaz should marry Ruth, and he took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz as a sign that the transaction was legal. It might seem funny to us, but the natives of Great Britain were probably still running around in animal skins, painted in wool, and drank dragging women off by the hair at that time. I think the whole concept of a legal system would have been beyond them. The consequence of this legal argument was that Ruth's relationship with Boaz, which had begun in a somewhat irregular manner, was publicly acknowledged. But I don't say any more, because I think that John probably wants to do that himself next week. However, one thing I'll risk telling you is that nearly 40 years ago, we had our first woman curate, and she did a series of sermons on messy women. By this, she meant women who were named in the geology, gene, sorry, genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, which comes at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. That starts with Abraham as the father of Isaac, and it goes on saying father of, until it gets to Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And then it carries on just saying father of, until it gets to Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Followed by Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And then it's all men until it gets to Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. So Ruth is one of only four women mentioned in the family tree of Jesus, according to Matthew. We'll see if John tells us that next week. So, as Joan reminds us, the story of Ruth is a story of great significance. It points beyond itself. It points to the God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so we're going to say the words of the Creed together as we remind ourselves of this God who sent his Son into the world to be born of a woman and to die for us and to rise again. So we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so now we come to our intercessions, and our prayers will be led for us by Steph. Loving Lord, Jesus, our guardian redeemer, we come to you this morning, thanking you for claiming us as yours. You chose us, the people called your church, to be your bride. Hear us as we ask you to bring change in our lives, our community and the world. We pray for areas of the world in conflict and distress. Especially we pray for the city of Beirut, devastated by the explosion few weeks ago. Bring help and organisation to those still in dire need. And we pray for the government to work for the people and to bring them comfort and aid in their distress. We remember the wildfires in California and pray for the fire services and others for helping them from around the world. Keep them, all residents and wildlife, safe as they battle the fires. We pray for areas.
areas of the world torn apart by conflict and political unrest, especially Belarus, Yemen, Syria and Gaza. Lord of peace, please bring your shalom, wholeness and peace to these and all areas of conflict. For those escaping these areas as refugees or economic migrants, especially those who are children. Protect them from people smugglers and slave traders. Many countries are preparing for political elections. We pray for honest and just processes to be maintained and for the one you choose to be elected for the benefit of the country. We pray for your church worldwide, especially those suffer suffering persecution for their faith. And give them strength and comfort, Lord. And we pray for our two archbishops, Justin and Stephen, and for our diocese and Bishop Pete, and Bishop designate Canon Sophie for Archdeacons Malcolm and Javid, and for all clergy and their families, especially John and Helen. And we pray for our cathedral at this difficult time, having disbanded the choir. We pray you will bring the Dean Peter, the cathedral chapter and staff and all involved in the dispute to reconcile with each other and to work together to solve the situation amicably in Christ. And we pray for your plans for this parish and the town of Wimble as the PCC comes together to find the right way for us to be involved and find the funding we need to accomplish our vision. And we pray for this town with Broomhill Hemingfield and Joan, and ask that we may find ways to reach the people with your good news of Jesus our Redeemer. And we especially ask you to help us to reach those who have been drawn to us or any church during lockdown through online services. <clears throat> help us to be able to nurture and feed them for them to grow as your followers. Give clergy the skills to continue online ministry without overburdening themselves and give them wisdom to manage time and to delegate wherever possible. And we pray for the World Health Organization and all governments as they come from and deal with the effects of COVID-19. Help them to make wise and practical decisions to prevent further spread and a second wave. And we pray for all those affected by the virus for a swift and full recovery and bring comfort to those bereaved in this time. We also pray for those now going back to work and school we also remember the vast number of people now unemployed and frightened for their homes or financial circumstances and give them hope and security. And we pray for any who are sick in body, mind or spirit who need our prayer today. We pray especially for Maria with her back problems and her scan results and also her friend Amanda, who has been diagnosed with cancer. And we remember those affected by the crash on Summer Lane of the other week, and ask for physical and mental healing for the victims, emergency personnel, witnesses, and the perpetrators. And we remember those that have recently passed away. And we pray for the family of George Ball, 
who died last Friday. And we remember those also whose funerals have taken place recently and their family friends also. We ask to bring them peace and comfort at this difficult time. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we close our prayers by saying together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. And just to say to you by way of notices that uh, this coming week uh, our, there'll be our prayer meeting on Thursday night. That's Thursday night at seven o'clock uh, by Zoom. So if you'd like to take part in that, uh, please drop me an email, John Gordon Armstrong 1964 at gmail.com. And uh, I can send you the access codes. Usually do it sort of late on on Thursday afternoon. But that's Thursday at 7 p.m. for about half an hour. And also to say to you, we will be back uh, at this time next Sunday, we're back 10 a.m. Sunday morning for our broadcast service. So we'd love to welcome you back to that. But um, I don't think I need to say anything else except to say we're going to sing our closing hymn. close our service with the words of the blessing. So now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, 
the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.